Welcome to our annual special report on winter weather, 13 WREX's Project Blizzard. Over the next half hour, myself and meteorologists Claudia Olick and John Jurgens give you an in-depth look at the dangerous winter weather we've experienced in the past year and what to do the next time events like these develop. And we also also take a look at the winter to come and gauge just how severe that this winter could be. So we start tonight with one of the biggest headlines from last winter. While big snowstorms, they get all the attention, it's the smaller ones that can creep up on you and cause a major headache, just like we saw on January 27th at the start of this year. So less than one inch of snow dropped. That was enough to cause a couple hundred vehicles to crash between Beloit and Janesville on I-39. We explore what first responders face when responding to this massive pileup and what you should do if you get caught in a scary situation like this. A quick burst of snow and strong winds was enough to cause whiteout conditions in less than one hour. Combined with near freezing temperatures, I-39 quickly turned dangerous. I mean, it was like a five mile stretch of interstate that got hit. And if you were, you know, three or four miles north of the crash scene, you had dry roads and you had clear conditions. You were three or four or five miles south of the crash scene, clear roads and dry conditions. It was just that, that section in the middle that got bad. People were, you know, they're driving on a winter day on a dry road. And within a mile, they went from a dry road to an inch of snow, which isn't a lot, but it's enough to make the road slippery. Drivers couldn't see or stop, causing a chain reaction. The aftermath, nearly 30 people injured and over 200 vehicles crashed, including a few on fire. Quiet day quickly turned busy for the Wisconsin State Highway Patrol and the Department of Transportation. Typically when these calls come in, we're already calling for first responders, EMS, fire, uh, more resources if we need them. Um, but I think it was uh, probably within about 30 minutes we realized, wow, this is, you know, we got about a half mile of cars that are, that are backed up. The four of us were the initial ones on scene and it was, you know, like running through the crash scene and climbing over vehicles, hollering at people and checking people just to see what we had basic for injuries. Um, ended up working our way through the southbound crash saw the semi on fire on the northbound side and then the northbound crash behind that. The best way to not get in the middle of a pileup like this is to avoid it in the first place. Whenever snow is in the forecast, plan ahead, know when it may be coming and try to stay ahead of the showers. If you have to drive in these conditions, slow down and drive with a lot of care, even if the snow amounts seem light. Of course, do not speed through whiteout conditions. When it's just snowing and the roads are wet, uh, it's very difficult to tell if that's turned to ice or not. And so people are still typically driving the same speed and it can change very quickly and, and turn disastrous. Well, prepare for that stuff as ahead of time as much as you can. Increase your safety, your following distance, slow down. You know, don't text, don't use your phone, pay attention to the roadway, all the stuff that you hear in every single PSA that goes out. And it, you know, you never know. I mean, you can go from a perfectly good day to a 206 car pileup. Unfortunately, if you happen to be caught in a pileup, follow these instructions. The best recommendation is to stay in your vehicle, stay buckled, um, because if you went off uh, in a certain spot because of slippery conditions, there's a good chance someone else is going to go off in that same spot. Um, we do have, and, and in this instance, there's videos posted of people getting out of their cars and walking around the interstate as cars are still coming in and crashing. It's extremely dangerous. Don't get out! Don't get out! Stay right there! I mean, that's three or 4,000 pounds of metal around you to help protect you. So if somebody else does come in and crash into you, you're a lot more survivable if you're inside your vehicle than if you're standing on the interstate. Hopefully we don't see too many whiteout incidents this winter, but if we do, make sure to keep last January in mind and take care on the roads. In extreme cases, snow squall warnings may be issued. Think of these like a severe thunderstorm warning in the summer. While snow totals may be light, quick bursts of snow and severe winds may cause whiteouts and suddenly slippery roads. So pull over, if you can, into a safe spot until the snow squall has passed. Now, in order to help prevent accidents and slippery roads like we just showed you, road crews are hard at work every winter trying to stay one step ahead of the snowstorms. I spoke with the Illinois Department of Transportation on what all goes into keeping our roads clear of ice and snow. It's that time of year where the temperatures drop, the snow begins to fall, and driving can become more difficult. You have probably seen snow plows out after fresh snow, or even got stuck behind one, but IDOT does more than just plow snow. We have a, um, a brine mixture, liquid salt, we kind of refer to it as, um, and then some of the different trucks or trailers will have a, um, a spray tank on it, and then we'll usually go out and um, use that to apply it to the bridges mainly. 
Before hitting the roads, there are a few things they look at to help make the decision of whether or not they should go pre-treat. Typically, we keep an eye on the pavement temperatures, the forecast overnight temperatures or daily temperatures, um, and depends on how close we are to the last storm, if there's any residual um, treatment on the roadway. Um, so those are usually the factors we look at before we go out and pre-treat. IDOT doesn't have meteorologists of their own to gather this information. So they work with a company called DTN, whose meteorologists provide them with the forecast. So we actually take that weather forecast and use the weather models that are out there and then provide a, a forecast of what the pavement temperature is going to be and the conditions of that pavement based on the weather information. You can imagine how crucial pavement temperatures may be to IDOT and keeping commuters safe. We're really trying to make sure that we provide Illinois DOT with all the other weather information that's out there, that tactical decision information to be able to make both what we would consider real-time decisions, um, you know, that, that less than 24 hours out decisions, but also long-term planning. Making the right decision can be tricky during a weather situation, as many times there are a lot of moving parts. Forecasting for these storms can be just as challenging, but that's why DTN works hard to prepare an accurate forecast and consistently communicates with IDOT. They're looking at all of the factors of, amongst their equipment, the amount of material they have, the staffing they have, and then using that weather data from uh, multiple sources, including what we're able to provide them to be able to make the best decision possible. 80% of reported crashes during the winter happen in one to two inches of snow, according to a study done by the National Weather Service in Wisconsin. Contrary to popular belief, it is not the big snowstorms that cause a majority of car accidents. It doesn't take much to see slippery and hazardous conditions to develop on the roads. David has one piece of advice. The biggest thing, you know, hear it all the time, but it's be patient, you know, be aware of the, the pavement conditions and how quickly they can change. Um, give the trucks plenty of room because, again, you just, they're so hard to see around. Yeah, patience and keeping your distance is probably the, the best option. The next time winter weather arrives, IDOT has updated road conditions online that show which roads are partly, mostly, or completely covered with snow or ice. And keeping an eye on the forecast during the winter months will also help you and your family stay safe. Coming up on Project Blizzard, freezing rain and ice storms can be even bigger headaches than a hefty helping of snow. We help you navigate through the next time we get a sheet of ice instead of inches of snow. Welcome back to Project Blizzard. When we think of winter weather, many of us tend to think about the scenic sights of flurries flying through the sky, and in some cases, the snowstorms, which can cause slick road conditions over a few hours. Yeah, but we don't often consider other kinds of frozen precipitation, like freezing rain and ice. An ice storm can bring devastating impacts much quicker than most snowstorms ever could, something we learned earlier this year, on February 22, 2023. A winter storm brought significant accumulations of freezing rain across northern Illinois and southern Wisconsin. The Rockford Airport recorded more than a third of an inch of ice, which may not seem like much, but it adds at least 250 pounds of weight on everything from trees to buildings and power lines. In February storm, that weight, combined with wind gusts of up to 40 miles per hour, brought down countless trees and power lines. Over 100,000 power outages were reported during and after the storm across northern Illinois. So ice storms are particularly difficult because there's really nothing the municipality, ComEd, or citizens can really do to prepare. Um, we do the preparation months in advance by tree trimming, uh, eliminating the overhanging branches along the, the power lines where we see there could be a possible um, breakage. While there is difficulty in preparing for these storms, it remains quite difficult to forecast ice storms. That's because temperatures from the surface to the clouds overhead need to line up just right. If most or all of that air is below freezing, then we get snow or hardened ice pellets that we call sleet. But if that air is mostly above freezing, then water will be able to fall down to the surface in liquid form, what we call rain. But if the conditions line up just right and there's a shallow layer of colder air near the surface, then those raindrops will be able to freeze on contact with the ground. Trying to pinpoint the temperature, if you're 33 versus 32, everything's fine, right? But uh, once you get to that magic 32 point, that's when problems start to occur. 
Those problems include hazardous or potentially even impossible travel conditions, something that everyone has to contend with even the road crews. With ice storms, it takes a lot more time, right? You have to go a lot slower. Um, you know, these trucks, although they may be tens of thousands of pounds loaded, they will slide just like a small car. We're using, um, you know, brine solutions that lower that freezing point to kind of help us combat ice. Um, and then obviously just using road salt and, and taking our time to get that done. And if a particularly strong freezing rain event is likely, the National Weather Service will issue an ice storm warning. It's a rare warning for meteorologists, but you need to prepare for possible extensive tree damage, long-term power outages, and very dangerous travel conditions. Up next on Project Blizzard, snow and ice easily grab our attention, but the bitter cold can be just as dangerous. We detail what you need to think of the next time negative values appear in our forecast. Seems like every winter we see videos like this, taking a pot of hot water, throwing it in the air, watching it freeze in the frigid cold temperatures. And it's things like these that represent the fun part of extreme cold events, but these cold snaps can kill, especially when winter is at its worst. The lower the temperature, the less time you have to be out and the quicker it could probably happen to you. The most common type of cold injury is frostbite, when the body cuts off circulation to your extremities to protect your vital organs. The most obvious signs of frostbite include numbness of your fingers or toes, discoloration, or even ice crystals forming on your skin. With frostbite, it can be as bad as you can lose fingers, toes, you know, you can lose parts of your body if you don't get things heated back up and circulation back to that area. Hypothermia presents a more deadly concern. That's when the body's core temperature drops below 95 degrees Fahrenheit. Signs of hypothermia you should look out for include confusion, slurred speech, and stiff muscles. But even heating back up can be dangerous if you're not careful after a long time out in the cold. You can burn your skin or cause burns if you have too hot a water. So you want to slowly let those vessels get opened back up again and allow blood flow. You don't want to do anything quickly. So how fast can frostbite develop on our skin? It mostly depends on just how cold it is outside. This can be figured out by determining the wind chill. That figure is a very important one to the meteorologist at the National Weather Service. The wind chill uh, is, is meant to represent what your body would feel, the temperature. So if you envision if the winds are basically light or nearly calm, your body heat is going to radiate out and probably heat the air just around your body. So you're not going to feel, even though it's cold outside, you won't feel quite as cold, but you bring in the wind, that wind is just going to take away any, any layer of slightly warmer air near your body. It's going to keep taking that away. So in a sense, your, your body is going to cool down and feel a lot colder much faster. Using that wind chill number, we can actually estimate how quickly frostbite can settle in. As this chart shows us, frostbite can happen in as little as 30, 10, or even 5 minutes. And you don't have to look back very far to see when it was that cold here at home. Just about 5 years ago, on January 31st, 2019, we dropped to a staggering negative 31 degrees, the coldest it has ever been in Rockford's history. Wind chills pushed down to 50 below, putting people at risk of frostbite in just 10 minutes. During that cold snap, a huge fire broke out at the Rockford Township building on Springfield Avenue, putting firefighters in danger not just fighting the fire, but also fighting frostbite. We want to make sure that you know we bring in additional resources so we can rotate our crew so we don't have to expose our personnel to the extreme temperatures for prolonged periods of time. If you need to be outside when winter is at its worst, there are some simple steps you can take to keep yourself out of danger. Any exposed skin, that's the problem. So you want to cover that skin's layers are warmth. So if you layer yourself on underneath of any type of outer clothing that you have, that's going to buy you some more time and keep you warmer. And on our website, you can find links to local warming shelters across the state line. See when they open and what resources they provide right now on the Project Blizzard page on WREX.com. Coming up after the break, dreaming of a white Christmas this year? We'll go over the odds of getting snow in time for the holidays, plus a look at how severe this winter may be. That's all coming up on Project Blizzard. 
Welcome back to Project Blizzard. The end of each year comes with a special time where families and friends gather to celebrate some of our favorite holidays. Some look forward to spending time with those loved ones or receiving gifts, and others look forward to that white fluffy snow. Because it feels so much more magical because it's a special holiday. There is something truly special about waking up on the morning of a holiday with fresh snow on the ground and the flakes still slowly falling. However, most years we aren't lucky enough to see a white blanket across the state line in time for the holidays. When you hear the term white Christmas, that is defined by one inch on the ground on or at least by December 25th. According to the National Weather Service in Chicago, Rockford sees a white Christmas only 44% of the time, with data going back to 1950. Here is a record of how many times we have seen a white Christmas and how much snow was recorded. The last time Rockford saw snow by December 25th was in 2017, with one to three inches on the ground at the time. Despite the five-year gap, there is a chance the state line could see snow. But if you want snow, head up north to the Rocky Mountains or even northern Minnesota, where the chances jump up to 90%. Back in our own state, northern Illinois presents the best probability of seeing snow late in December compared to the rest of the state, according to this graphic. Whether or not we see snow during the holiday season is also very dependent on our current weather patterns. We need the right conditions and, of course, cold enough temperatures to see snow falling. And when we do get snow during the holidays, there are a few words that come to mind. Nice, warm, happy. Some say they would only like snow during this time of year. It's more fun to have snow during the holidays. Snow could be fun and special, but not everyone can say that they like it. Probably I don't. So we're currently in a long stretch without a white Christmas, and if we don't see snow on the ground by December 25th, this will mark the sixth year in a row without a technical white Christmas. So you're probably wondering what the chances are of getting that white Christmas this year, but what we are expecting for this season as a whole might give us a better idea. So that's that time now to address the question we get this time every year. What kind of winter are we going to get? Besides the easy answer of cold and snowy, like around uh, these parts usually, we have a chance to see a different winter this time around compared to the past three years. First time in three winters, we will not have La Nina influencing our weather. Instead, the weather is on track to see a moderate to strong El Nino. The stronger the La Nina or El Nino, the more likely we see its influence all winter long. El Nino occurs when the tropical ocean waters in the central and eastern Pacific are warmer than average. The warm waters tweak the jet stream, which in turn influences the temperature and rain and snow patterns across the northern hemisphere. So what does El Nino do to our winters? El Nino tends to extend the jet stream eastward and pushes it southward. The jet stream is a river of air and moisture, so it pushes more precipitation into these areas. That's why the southern U.S. gets wetter and potentially colder weather than usual through the winter months. Across the northwest and into the Midwest, warmer and drier than average weather is likely. And what we tend to see or have seen in past ones is that uh, we tend to see that the polar jet, which kind of separates the colder, really cold weather from, you know, the milder type temperatures, that tends to be suppressed further to the north uh, during those types of winters. So we actually tend to see milder winters. We can also look backwards at past El Ninos to see how they performed. We had a uh, strong El Nino back in the late 90s. 97, 98 was a strong El Nino. And more recently, I believe uh, 2016 was a strong El Nino type event. And in both of those winters, we saw uh, fairly warm condition, mild conditions uh, through the winter seasons here and uh, below average snowfall. While we're unlikely to see a very strong El Nino like 2016, the past several strong to very strong El Ninos resulted in 10 to 12 inches less for snowfall compared to average. We may see similar results this winter if El Nino remains strong. We could still end up getting walloped by a snowstorm or two, but the entire season may end up lacking in snowfall. So does a warming climate factor into all of this? On its own, our winters are the fastest warming season of the year. Rockford's winters are 5 degrees warmer than 50 years ago. That may not sound like much, but that means 17 additional warm winter days. Keep in mind, there are still cold days in a warming world, just not as cold. Same with bitter cold spells, we just see shorter ones. Throw in El Nino on top of all this and the results could be amplified. We will still get the occasional bitterly cold day or weeks, just less of them. If you live in the area this winter, just be prepared. Even in El Nino events, we do still get snow 
and we do still see some winter weather. It just tends to be less so than an otherwise uh, normal winter. So here's the forecast. Outside of the usual, bitter cold snaps will likely be warmer than usual most days. Snowfall may be down several inches to even a foot. But keep in mind, all it takes is a little snow and ice to cause major issues, so be ready for whatever winter throws our way. Now, El Nino won't be the only driver this winter. Smaller climate patterns may come into play and are harder to forecast more than a week or two out. Think of it like a pot of soup. El Nino is the main flavor, but other ingredients get sprinkled in that could overpower El Nino for a little while. That's why we'll still see a bit of bitter cold or a snow or ice storm from time to time. That wraps up our special report for Project Blizzard. We hope that this information keeps you and your loved ones prepared and safe for this winter. Of course, anytime winter weather threatens, turn to our forecast and expertise before, during, and after the storm. And be sure to visit our website, 13WREX.com, for a more detailed look into the science of forecasting this winter season. Thanks for watching and have a great night.